Here we go. Uh, so right now you can see a slide with information about the Menti code, and uh, that will come handy throughout the day. Uh, so you can already put in the code, and then uh, the presenter will let you know when it's going to be used. So with that said, I move forward and uh, welcome you to today's uh, today's agenda. And I think I press once more. Let's let's stop here. So, dear colleagues and friends, uh, a warm welcome to day two of the Open Science for. Um, the policy to practice. And this conference is associated with the Swedish presidency of the Council of the European Union. And the three main organizers are the National Ri Library of Sweden, the Swedish Research Council, and the Swedish Museum of Natural History. However, there is a large group of organizations that has made these two days possible. And I would like to start the day by just mentioning them all. So these organizations include the European Commission of Joint Research Center, the Swedish Higher Education Institutions, the European Network of Science Centers and Museums, Euroscience, the Swedish National Commission for UNESCO, the Swedish Science Centers, Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center, Young Academia, uh, or Young Acad Academy of Sweden, I should say. Uh, and last but not least, the organization actually kept all these organizations together, and that is public and science. And I also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Riksbankens Jubileumsfond for their financial support. And as you just heard, we are quite a diverse group that has put together this conference. And that is also mimicked in uh, the composition of the delegates attending the conference. The speakers come from eight different countries. And the delegates come from 19 different countries. I find this amazing. And we're both here on site and digitally. Um, so, as the director of the Swedish Museum of Natural History, I would uh, uh, especially welcome you to the site of today's conference, which is the museum. And we know from experience that, oops, that most people uh, think about our wide-ranging public activities when they hear about the museum. Uh, we have about 600,000 visitors yearly, and we are the most vid uh, digitally visited museum in Sweden. Uh, so public activis activities are extremely important if we want to aim for society that is based on a foundation of scientific knowledge and uh, shared values. Uh, and the position of the museum is to be the research museum. And this is uh, to highlight the legacy of the museum as a research institution. This diagram reflects the distribution of resources at the museum between the research and collections and uh, public engagement. So the fact that more than three quarters of our resources are put towards research and collections and that we publish about 250 scientific papers each year come as a surprise to many people. So with that said, I hope you feel that we are the right place for today's uh, discussion. Uh, and the theme of today is embedding open science in society. And we will do this divided into three different parts, as you can see here on, on the slide. And I hope you'll be able to stay the full day. Because in the end, we have something very special to look forward to. We will actually be visited by uh, the Ministry for Culture, Parisa Liljestrand, and we are very happy to, to welcome her to the conference and see and listen to her uh, perspectives on this subject. 
Um, before I, I give the floor to the first uh, session of the day, I just want to welcome you to a guided tour in the museum. So if you're here on site and you have a little bit of more time to, uh, to spend, uh, please uh, join us for the guided tours. Okay, let's see what happens now. Oh. Yes. So science for policy making. I would like to invite uh, Agnieszka Gadzina Kolodnieska, Deputy Head of Unit, European Commission Joint Research Center, uh, to the stage. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a true pleasure to be here in Stockholm to discuss with you science for policy. Uh, we hear all around yesterday, we will be still discussing today how important science is for society. Let me bring it a level uh, more how important the science is actually for our democracies and the resilience of our democracies. And a uh, crucial part where it comes to play is actually science for policy. So I'm uh, very happy to be here to discuss it today with you. My colleague will, uh, will also join the presentation and I give the floor to my fellow co-organizers. My name is Christoph Humburg. I'm the scientific head of the Baltic Sea Center and I would like uh, to welcome you here in the room but also those of you who are with us on Zoom on behalf of Stockholm University to this session on science for policy. As I understood yesterday, you had important discussions and sessions about open science issues, which I think perfectly sets the scene for today's session on bridging the gap between uh, science and policy, which is also one of the main focus of our center here, the Baltic Sea Center, and you will hear about more about this during the session. I'm really looking forward to this uh, nice session. Thank you. Hello, there we go, okay. So my name is Sverk Lundin, I'm the CEO of the Young Academy of Sweden, and we're also one of the organizers today. Um, the Young Academy of Sweden is a uh, interdisciplinary academy for a selection of the most prominent younger researchers in Sweden. So um, in essence, we're a, a platform for younger researchers to have a stronger voice in the policy deb debate. And we also work a lot with public engagement and internationalization. One of our most appreciated activities in the academy is a network program that we have together with parliament. So we organize this together with the societies for MPs and researchers, or RIFO in Swedish. And that gives younger researchers an opportunity to meet MPs and exchange on their respective roles. Um, we also are a founding member of YASAS, the Young Academy Science Advice Structure in the EU, that link up to the other academy network in Europe that can then provide science advice for policymaking in Europe. So this topic today is really important to us, and I'm delighted to see all of you here and uh, to be able to discuss this today. Now I will leave over to Gunn, who will, Gunn Rudqvist, who will moderate the session. Welcome, Gunn. Thank you, and thanks to all of you, the organizers. So a warm welcome to all of you who are here in the room and also all of you watching online. My name is Gunn Rudqvist. I work also at Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center as head of policy. So as Christoph was saying, science for policy is at the core of what the Baltic Sea Center is, is doing every day, really. So I'll be trying to guide us through this session from 9 to 11. There'll be a break, but no coffee. So um, please, I hope you've had coffee and you who are online can have your coffee, of course. Yesterday, we got so many good and interesting discussions and presentations that actually lay the foundation for this session. We heard about open science from the perspective mostly of the researchers. And this session will take us a step further towards practice, really. And we will talk more about how you bridge the gap between science and the rest of society. You know, the number of stakeholders out there who need all your results. There will be four presentations from uh, people with different uh, angles of this topic. And then we will finalize with a panel with three people. And they also come from different perspectives and we will be talking about this. So please, you know, think about questions and comments and send them over Menti 
and we will try to address them during the last session, you know, the part that is a panel discussion. But the schedule is full and it's a bit of a hectic schedule, so let's step right on to it. So our first speaker is Mikael Karlsson. Here you are, Mikael. Welcome up here and join me. Mikael, you are an associate professor in environmental science and you also lead the Climate Le Leadership Research Group at Uppsala University. But you have a long background in policy and science issues. I mean, both from your research perspective, but also as previous chair of one of the largest NGOs in Sweden, working a lot with policy issues. So please, Mikael, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. I think this is uh, important and also a timely conference. Science describes the world, politics govern the world, from uh, decisions on who should have the cereals first in the morning uh, over breakfast, the youngest kid or the one starting school first, to international treaties on climate change, and how to counteract and combat that. Science is concerned with facts, policies, politics is concerned with norms. It's sometimes said that science then should speak truth to power. The question is, to what extent is that possible at all? Which is, I would say, a challenging question since Nothing here could be achieved in this conference today without science. Science is fundamentally indispensable in the modern world. Everything we know from agriculture to medicine to technologies, communication, transportation, is dependent on scientific findings. At the same time, politics is indispensable if you want to act on what science shows is happening with the climate system, with the ozone layer, with biodiversity. And it's clear from scientific studies that liberal democratic governance systems are superior to all other systems in coping with these challenges and finding solutions based on the warnings coming from science. But science is based on evidence. Politics deal with values. Science function according to review and revise. In politics, you debate and vote. In science, Earth can be either flat or spheric. In politics, you can negotiate and say that the world is an oval. So they are very different characters in these systems. Science is open, politics is closed. Science is, is, is conducted by experts, policies, politics, by laymen, by ordinary people. Scientists can be politicians, but it's very difficult for politicians to be scientists without much training. Science is very precise. Politics is characterized by rhetoric. Science functions according to principles. Politics is opportunistic. Science often takes a lot of time, whereas politics is functioning in rapid systems on a daily basis or terms of office. So there are differences in terms of contexts, cultures, objectives, motives, audiences, language, financing, and a lot of other things that we see makes it difficult. Still, if we have science as one sphere and policy and politics as another, they are not separated. We see politicians interfering in science. For instance, someone might have the idea to kick out all those in the boards of universities. And we see scientists speaking about politics, for instance, to abandon parts of the law on ethical um, applications. But when science now delivers all these truths about what's happening with the climate system, with toxic substances, with loss of biodiversity. Do politics act on that? The tragic answer is no. 
not according to the target set by the politicians themselves. 15 out of 16 environmental quality objectives in Sweden are not reached. We're the same on EU, we have the same in numerous countries, we're the same uh, on the global situation. So what can be done then? Well, <clears throat> I would base this on having worked in some 20 governmental inquiries in Sweden as an expert in different capacities, five, six high-level groups on uh, EU policies at the EU Commission and in a lot of other fora. And I would say that in science, first out of 10 points is to, to counteract science denial, to speak out what does science say, and take a stance against those denying science, whether it's about the Holocaust, climate change, or relativity theory, or something else. That is something that all scientists have to do. A second point in order to do that is to promote scientific consensus as often as, as possible, in particular when we have the, the long-term wicked problems on the agenda. Those where you see the costs now, but the benefits in terms of smaller problems in the future, some, some, some other time, somewhere else. Then it's very important to build consensus, to generate a strong pool of facts. Where would we have been in climate governance without IPCC, for example? And why are we lacking that type of scientific consensus building bodies in other areas of critical problems? A third thing is, of course, to, that scientists need to reflect over their role. And this can be characterized in different ways. One categorization is that we have the, the, pure, the pure scientist uh, as one of four, focusing on the scientific um, research questions, not interacting with society. We have the science arbiter, we have the issue advocate, and we have the honest broker, who, to various extent, interact with society. And as a fourth point, I think, therefore, it's important to be transparent on your norms. When I do climate governance research, I'm clear that, well, I want to find ideas, solutions, policy, governance systems that promote the fulfillment of the Paris Agreement or the Swedish Parliament's climate targets. So that's where I'm standing, which makes it possible not only for me to evaluate policies, but also for others to evaluate what I'm doing. In these interactions, we also need to be, as scientists, policy relevant. And um, that, of course, requires that you know something. Scientists that work as experts and give expert-based advice, or science-informed advice, whatever you call it, need to learn how does the policy cycle function. The questions what, why, who, when, that are relevant in policy making are crucial for scientists to think about. What's the timing? How can I be relevant? And what's the delivery method? Writing a scientific paper, nothing more. Writing a popular report, writing an op-ed for each scientific paper, communicate face-to-face, -face, attend meetings, participate in processes, in committees, etc. And also to promote and actually present alternatives for policymakers. Uh, and explaining the pros and cons with those. A sixth point is transdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity for me is more than scientists working together uh, and being very open on methods and theories, but also to involving stakeholders. At least if you do societal relevant research, um, for instance about landscape governance or whatever it might be, to include them. Seventh point would be in the extension of that, to think about inclusiveness, openness in relation to society, which is a theme, of course, for, for these days as well. Participatory science, citizen science, to think about that. Sometimes it's crucial, sometimes it's not needed. When is it needed and not? Point eight, be self-critical and be open. Question your own results and communicate also uncertainties in findings. That is very important because someone else will do it anyway and then you will lose your trust and credibility. Of course, it's about honesty. Ninth point, build trust. We see uh, 
quite high trust in, in, in science. And we also see in European meters, I think it was 68, 70 percent, something like that, wanted scientists to be active on societal issues, but trust building is crucial. And the last point is defend the integrity of science. Speak out when you see too much political interference, when politicians, well, move into details in university governance or criticize researchers or as when I was in yesterday, yesterday in Gothenburg at the university, we had an open seminar in the evening. There were five politicians sitting with film cameras filming the audiences when they asked questions, wanting to put it on the net. Such things happen increasingly. In politics, well, it's just as important for politicians as for scientists to counteract science denial. And to, of course, avoid denying science yourself. We see that happening all around the world and in the Swedish parliament. It's important to defend science. Politicians should have at least one arm length to science, not interfere in details. Keep your fingers off universities, trust them. And be clear on facts and norms. Don't confuse them. Of course, you can vote whether or not the Earth is flat or spheric and end up with the Earth being an oval and criticize favorable conservation status or climate sensitivity, but we seldom see politicians voting on how many people can this elevator lift. Scientists say 10 and politicians vote for 12. That's not happening. But in other fields, this is a fact today, including in environmental governance, and that's so strange. It's important as a fourth point to generate arenas for meetings. And fifth, when seeking science-based advice, don't take scientists as hostages. Don't use them as for getting, a, in my field, a green alibi. Give sufficient time for learning. And I think the Swedish All Party Committee on Environmental Objectives is a very good example where politicians who debated fiercely in the parliament, in society at large, actually set together the seven democratic parties in a room for one and a half, two years and came out with the most ambitious climate policy framework in the world. After having listened to expertise and of course weighted alternatives based on the various norms that they defended. Abandon appraisal dogmas. We often see that a call for, well, new classic economic tools when we know from science that they're clearly insufficient to understand and grasp and deal with wicked problems um, in governance systems. Avoid silos, pro promote co coherence, etc. Six point in governance, build organizations, build boundary organizations, research councils, climate policy councils, um, other types of, of bodies that can deliver scientific advisors, etc., that can deliver science-based advice. There are numerous examples around the world. Seventh, it is, of course, crucial to also use the scientific findings in not only appraisals, but in decision-making in the end. Often, a lot of information is gathered, but that's where it stops, and then policy-making continues as if that evidence is not there. Eight, defend public service media. It's crucial for communication. Ninth, finance science communication. I think we have a, at least two order of magnitude more financing in doing research than communicating research. And of course, that steers uh, scientists' priorities. Last point is, as for scientists, to build trust and to avoid populism, and polarization, which are actually, again, becoming more common today. That's not how we build a better world. Is it finally then just a lot of gaps, a gloomy situation? Are politicians not listening to science? Often not, but in many cases they are. And when I meet younger people and students and others who have anxiety and see that if there's no future due to climate change and biodiversity loss, etc. We can clearly see that what has happened in the last decades is that politicians have actually acted based on the best available science to much larger extent than ever before in history, 
you see European Union, US, other areas in the world moving on these crucial issues. We had the Paris Agreement in 2015, where we had politics for the first time considering scientific findings. And after that, the expected temperature increase by the end of this century is probably more than one 1.5 degrees lower than before. And then we're talking about two very different planets. So there is hope in havoc indeed. And science clearly shows that there is nothing in when it comes to economics, technical systems, natural resources that would prevent us to cope with all these global challenges. That is indeed possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mikael. I mean, as always, very sort of to, to the point. Uh, I loved your 10 things to go through, but you touched upon risks, of course, you know, that dual position and dual possibilities for a scientist. And I mean, you already talked about the fact that you are sometimes regarded as an activist and how, how are they? But are there other major risks, maybe from the more academia perspective? Well, I think academic systems, in, in the field of em environment studies, uh, it's not a problem today to, to be, I wouldn't consider, I, I think the word activist is a bit problematic. Um, and of, of course, all politicians love activists if they are active in support of what you're thinking. It's the same with all stakeholders. I'm the best scientist in the world, according to the Swedish forest industries, when I talk about bioenergy, but I say what science says about biodiversity, I'm the lousiest scientist in the world. And it's the same with political parties. So I think, I mean, I don't see it as a problem, but I think there should be, in science in general, first I think we should have more uh, financing of communication. Uh, we should have stricter demands uh, in research applications so to communicate science and and there should be also let's say so reward and career systems in science where it's not only the number of papers you have produced in in high-ranking journals that counts and i think we see a, a trend towards something else but also counteracting trends unless you publish in nature you're not worth it and i think that that really needs to be reconsidered in in um, by research councils and by the university. So you would love to see the funding sort of both coming maybe from the universities, so pushing and encouraging outreach work even more? Are they doing enough, the universities? N not at all. But I also think, I mean, a, a lot of science is it's about digging deeper and deeper in the hole without communication. Yeah, they need to do some, that as well. Some are skilled yes. to do that and they should do that. But if we talk about funding of research that is supposed to deliver scientific findings to, to uh, achieve the sustainable development goals, etc. I don't think you should give, science, give funding to projects that have no idea uh, about communication or that throw in stakeholders after they have received their funding. That's not relevant for the questions that, that are asked in society. I think, I think that's a very problematic. But I see that that's increasingly happening. Uh, at the same time, we have this international trend with high-ranking journals. That's what counts. So, um, much more needs to be done okay. so, in uh, Europe. So, final question before we have to sort of round up. Um, would you say that these trends are European-wide, international-wide, or are there changes? You know, is it Europe is standing out as something different, or what do you see in your international outlook? Um, I think it's important as a scientist to say that you don't know sometimes, and I don't. Okay, that's a good thing. Final perfect way. Thanks a lot, Mika. <laughs> Here's a small gift for you to bring home. <laughs> All right, we will move on directly to the next fantastic speaker. And I welcome Julian Keimer up on the stage. You are from the European Commission Joint Research Center. Very welcome, a warm welcome. I hope you had a good traveling here to Stockholm. You will talk a bit about sort of what does the European Commission work with and you have yourself a research background and you are also knowledge manager and you've worked a lot with issues on values and identities in your present work as well. Please indeed. Julian, you're welcome. That's correct. Uh, yeah, indeed. So I wait for my slides to come. Uh, do I have to? Yes, yes, I have to do it myself. Right. Got it. Yes. 
makes sense. Um, yeah, welcome. Thank you for uh, being allowed to speak here. So I will give you the perspective um, of yeah, an international perspective or an EU perspective on evidence-informed policy making and science for policy. Um, uh, as Gun just said, I'm from the Joint Research Center, like my colleague Agnieszka, who spoke uh, in the opening of this session. And maybe I should give you a short um, introduction of what the Joint Research Center actually is and does, because it's part of the European Commission, but it's actually a research center. So the main focus is to advise policy with uh, with excellent science. So there are more than 2,000 researchers working there um, who, um, who yeah, advise the policy makers who then draft laws or in, yeah, come up with funding programs or other programs to change how Europeans well, live their lives ultimately um, with scientific evidence. And if we're going to the next slide now, well, you could ask, why do we even need better science, or why do we want better science, better evidence for policy? Uh, and there are fundamentally four reasons. Uh, one, we are dealing with complex problems. And you don't easily solve complex problems with just a rule-by-thumb approach. You actually need some good evidence, good science to solve them. Then, citizens also want it. Uh, there are various surveys where citizens express that they want scientists to get involved in policy making and they want policy makers and politicians to be, uh, they want scientists, uh, scientists to call out policy makers and politicians if they use incorrect science or fake science. So there's actually demand for this kind of service. And um, thirdly, it helps counter mis and disinformation. So obviously, there's a lot of mis and disinformation out there. There are people who just have incorrect perceptions about scientific knowledge, but there are also people who um, actually want to spread factually incorrect knowledge, knowingly want to spread that knowledge. Um, and bringing good scientific knowledge into policy making helps counter that. Um, because it also reinforces the, the policy makers in their uh, belief that, well, there is some kind of actually correct information that they can trust. Um, or, well, I'm going to sort of go a bit into relativizing the term correct that I used here now later on, but um, let's keep it for now. And it enriches public debates. It actually makes public debates more interesting, more, more complete if we don't just talk on a surface level, but talk about actually good evidence. And um, we approached this problem in our team um, by looking at the science for policy ecosystems in various EU member states. So, oh yeah, I, I know, yeah, sorry. Um, like, I'm, I'm, I'm having the slides here looking for me, <laughs> but I also have to change them for you, obviously. <laughs> um, so, science for policy ecosystems. There are ultimately three aspects of these ecosystems. There is the use of experts in public administration. So, how um, public administration demands information from experts, but also how experts have access to public administration, the internal capacity of public administration, and you could argue, in, in some sense, the JRC uh, is somehow some kind of public uh, uh, internal capacity of a public administration, um, but you also often, uh, just in ministries, for example, in uh, ministries of economy, you often have analysts who can run their own scientific analyses and in other ministries you have other um, kinds of experts who can run their own analyses so there may be already quite strong capacity inside the public administration and then the processes for exchange calls for evidence or areas um, of research interest where there is actual direct exchange fora where policymakers and scientists can come together and exchange information, exchange views, and also build trust, because we learned that um, 
building trust is actually extremely important through a series of national workshops that we did where we discussed with experts in the national ecosystems what um, what is most important, what is working well, what is difficult, what are the problems that they are struggling with, both from the side of the policy makers, but also from the side of the scientists. Um, and what would each of them need to get better? And that way we understood that there are actually three aspects that are a bit different than the three I mentioned before to good science for policy. There's the institutional environment, but there's also the individual capacity of policymakers and scientists, um, and also the group capacity of teams. And then there is something like fair use or good governance of evidence. Um, and if you don't fully, if it's not fully clear to you what that last aspect is right now, I will explain it a bit later because that goes back to what Gunn introduced me with values and identities. So, if we're looking at the institutional support, we are trying to help as the Joint Research Center, as the evidence-informed policymaking team in the Joint Research Center, we're trying to help member states, regions, um, to get better at it. But also, obviously, the European Commission itself and the European institutions. There is the better regulation framework, um, there is um, also a new vision for public administration fit for the future and all of that we hope can lead to a new era of, um, um, of, of public administration, of evidence-informed policy making, a policy framework co-creation with member states for research and innovation. Um, so these are sort of their various um, options for institutional support and I will actually come to a specific example of institutional support a little bit later uh, once I've um, summed up the, the general approach. Then there is the individual capacity, individual and team capacity and to tackle that problem we have created competence frameworks for policymakers and for researchers. Competence frameworks to tell them, but also tell their organizations which competences they need to work together better. Um, and for scientists, it's the one on the bottom. There are five clusters of competences. In each of these clusters, there are three to six competences. And um, each competence, you can have different levels. And now if you think about it, you can't be an expert in everything, but there should probably be someone in the organization that you're working in who is an expert in everything. I mean, not one person, but somebody should be, you should have one person to be an expert in the one thing and another one to be an expert in the other thing, and so on. So that on a, on a team level or on an organization level, everything is covered. And based on that, we've developed trainings for policymakers, uh, for, for researchers, and we are developing a training for policymakers um, to work better together. For the researchers, we also have already trained trainers um, that in various member states so that they can actually go out to other organizations, institutions that request this training and give it there. So if you're interested in such a training, come to me. There are actually people in this room who have taken the training of trainers and who would hopefully be happy to help you. But lastly, to coming to the last point, we also don't want things to be an expertocracy. So I talked about fair use of evidence and um, good governance of evidence use. Evidence can take us so far if we know what our goals are, but it doesn't tell us what we should actually aim for as a society. That's a political question, and that is a political question that is informed by values and a political discussion and debate about these values. Um, and that's why we also did research into values and identities and um, 
uh, meaningful and ethical communication will be the next output from this research program. Um, and there, we are basically trying to understand what are the delineations between what evidence can do for you as a public administration or as a policymaker, and what you have to get from people's values, political decision-making, political sort of guidance. Um, yeah, we hope in that way, <coughs> by, by sort of splitting up the debate and saying, well, look, that's, the, that's a values question, we can't answer it with evidence, we hope to actually agree more on the evidence and then accept that we may have different values, because it's okay to have different values to a certain degree. And now I'm coming to a practical... Ah, okay, this is, I'm just going to give you the whole slide already. Um, coming to a practical example of how all of this can practically be implemented, or how we can practically try to implement this. So first of all, we started off with a um, commission staff working document. Um, and this hopefully in the future will lead to council conclusions, um, also on evidence-informed policy making or science for policy. Um, in this staff working document, there are various, um, various mechanisms, various support mechanisms offered to member states. And um, one of them or is the technical support instrument of DG reform. And there, under this instrument, my unit is currently working with seven member states. Uh, Sweden, sadly, is not among them because they, they have to apply. Um, you have to apply yet, indeed. Yeah. Um, you have to apply as a member state to be part of uh, any technical support instrument project, and these seven member states applied for better science for policy. Um, and there we are actually working together with them in first assessing in depth the current state of their science for policy ecosystem, um, but also then improving them with, for example, the trainings that I just mentioned, um, giving them to policymakers, to trainers there who can then train more people in their organizations. Um, so that's a practical use, and if you feel that maybe in your member state you want to convince someone to apply, uh, please go ahead. Uh, we would be very happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Julian, and so nice to hear both you and Mikael sort of stressing values and trust and building dialogue. And as I see you mean the Joint Research Centre, they are doing tons of things. Could you also maybe talk a little bit about that forum for exchange that's available on the net, where researchers can sort of become a part of that? Because that would be a good sort of suggestion for people to step in, right? That's yeah. Actually, uh, a very good suggestion, thank you. Um, yeah, so we do have a, an online uh, forum called Knowledge for Policy, um, where all of you can register and um, exchange or post blog posts and so on um, and, and yeah by that be sort of more directly connected with researchers from the joint research center but also potentially uh, get more publicity for um, scientific knowledge that you can offer to policy making thank you i often hear from researchers that it's so difficult for them to sort of grasp the value and possibilities of the policymaker. How, how do you bridge that from the Joint Research Center? What, what do you do to get sort yeah. of that understanding increasing? Yeah, I think the, the two main things you can do is one, just create meeting opportunities and optimally not when, when there's already pressure there. So uh, when, not only when the policymaker needs information on something and uh, hopefully last week. But um, <laughs> but rather like just kind of meeting opportunities. So you're talking really um, about a continuous sort of exchange and dialogue. It's very helpful, yeah. Because time limits for policymakers is really, as you say, short. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. They want their but answer then, today. Of course, if you already understand each other a little bit yeah. and have a working relationship, maybe then it's easier to also maybe overcome these time limits or understand that you can call someone on a short notice and they they. St 
still try to help you, let's say, as exactly. a researcher. Yeah, they're only people only yeah. a phone call away, right? Sort of. Exactly. Well, that's, that's the nice thing about the Joint Research Center. It's inside the same organization that's a good um, for the policymakers on the European level, at least. And the other thing is these trainings that I mentioned. Um, we, so by now we have trained uh, more than half of all the researchers in the European Commission Joint Research Center have taken this training for researchers. And there, a part of that training is also a role-playing game where you have to engage with a sort of imagined policymaker and you have to put yourself into the position of a policymaker. And that helps from the side of the scientists to um, get to understand better what policymakers need. And now we're developing a similar training for policymakers to help them understand better how they can ask the right questions to scientists and, and how they can also work in a way that makes it possible for scientists to give them good answers. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. I think we should really ask you to come here to Sweden and do the same thing here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank so you. far, one warm welcome. Thank you. Julian, we have a small gift here, so coming this way, yes. Thanks a, lot. Um, thanks a lot, and this, I think, really created a good background for the next speaker, Ellen Bruno, who's a colleague of, me, of mine for the Stockholm University Baltic Sea Centre. You have a background as a marine biologist, but you've also been working all your life sort of in different policy situations. You, you've been to the European Commission working with marine issues there. You've been at the uh, MSC and you work with the NGO sector, etc. And you will give us a presentation of a more practical approach as sort of trying to give an example of how we can do this. Please, Ellen. Thank you, Gun. Gun, sorry. Um, Hi everyone and hello to you online. Um, so excited to be here today and to be able to share the working method that we have developed, I guess, mainly good, uh, at the Baltic Sea Center. Um, as you mentioned, I am a marine biologist, but I have been working on this policy, trying to change policy actually for many, many years. And, um, it's a, it's a skill I think quite many lobbyists know about, but maybe not so much in academia. And I will go through what we are a little bit shortly um, and why scientists should communicate, of course, and work together with policy. And also this knowledge broker that we call ourselves right now, or policy analyst, could we be a bridge or a key for helping out? And also some lessons learned from what we've been doing the last years. Uh, so the Baltic Sea Center belongs to Stockholm University. We have been around for 10 years. We actually just celebrated with bubbles and we've been working on this policy interactions for, well, the last six years at least. Um, we have researchers, we have communicators, and we have policy analysts. And we try to support our researchers. We have around 300 at Stockholm University, but we also have, of course, researchers all around the Baltic Sea. And our mission is to improve the status or improve the health of the Baltic Sea environment. So we have a very clear mission and we have a very broad mandate of how to work with that. We uh, attack it or we focus on the four main stresses on the Baltic Sea, the eutrophication, the hazardous substances, fisheries and climate change. And of course, the million dollar question is why? Um, and the answer, I guess, is quite simple as well. It's um, because it's actually required. It's uh, legal, legally required. Um, we have a Swedish Higher Education Act. I don't know if the same in all our countries, but where we have three main missions, it's to educate, it's to do research, and it's also to interact with the society. 
So this is the third task and it's something we talk quite a lot about and apparently something that we need to be better on. But besides that, so it's legally required, why would researchers want to do this? And we've asked them and they have, of course, different answers, all of them. Uh, some really feel like it's important that their work contribute to the scientific development. Um, some also feel like their own work gets better if they get this from the outside. And uh, the answers, I guess, are as many as scientists, but not all scientists are that interested either. Um, and for different reasons. I mean, some are really into studying their microcosmos and they love that. Um, still not, it, it doesn't always work. And uh, I'm, I took this from uh, one of the reports made by Vieteskapen Almenhet, one of the um, co-organizers here today. And they asked actually thousands of researchers who they would like to communicate with and who they want to use their knowledge. And they, on top of their list, was that they wanted to communicate with politicians and policymakers, and also actually with the general public. But the main person that they did communicate were professionals. So with doctors or engineers or people working within their area of expertise. Maybe not that weird. And the reason that they stated was that they have other higher priorities and they lack resources to communicate. And, and I guess this is where we come in. They have difficulties in finding the right opportunities and audiences to communicate with policymakers. So how can we overcome this? Well, at the Baltic Sea Center, we believe that knowledge brokers can be one way of doing it. Uh, a knowledge broker would have good scientific knowledge of the area they work within. Um, but also, and I guess this is what divides them from the research, they have a really good knowledge of how policy processes move. And ideally both in nationally, EU, globally. Um, if you come of age, like a few of us do, uh, you also probably have developed a pretty good network uh, with policymakers, with researchers and also stakeholders. So NGOs and other organizations that, you, that actually drives the agenda. And again, Good if you have good communication skills, because this, in the end, actually also is about communication. And ideally, they should um, know what's brewing. They should have the air to ground, and they should know quite early on what's moving. And I just took one of these examples. So we made a policy brief on advanced wastewater treatment already in 2017, when we saw that this is coming up. This is in the European Commission working plan to update the wastewater treatment directive. Um, and so already then we started working on getting the data we have from researchers to be able to put that into the process. Uh, right. Um, and of course, recognize the science needs and um, identify the proper channels pathways to come up with the knowledge that we, our researchers have. Um, facilitate the knowledge flow. That could be setting up meetings with, between scientists and policymakers. It could be seminars. I'll show a little bit more what we do. And of course, engage in discussions. There are lots of discussions going on, like conference like this, or um, of course, social media. Twitter, LinkedIn. There are, of course, also other ways of doing this. Our way is one way. Um, you can educate um, researchers about policy work, actually also communicators. 
Um, you can give them, I think as Michael said, you have to give them time and merit to do this kind of work because it takes actually a lot of time to follow processes, to read newspapers or newsletters and um, have lunch with policymakers, all these things that is done from behind. And I'm not sure all research want to do it. Uh, so, when do we actually engage in policy? Well, we have two quite clear uh, timings when we do things. The first is when we see that there is a policy process going on and we know that there is scientific knowledge that needs to be in there, in the process, for it to go the right way. And the second timing is when we have important scientific knowledge that we believe should lead some kind of policy process or political decision. So I would say that's the when. And what we communicate is always decided by the scientist. We, um, it often stems from a scientific paper um, and we always have the name of the scientist backing up the message. So it's not what I want, it's what our scientists say that they want or what they believe is the best policy option to reach a good environmental status, in this case, in the Baltic Sea. And so how do we do it? Well, we do quite a few of these policy briefs. Um, we answer to consultations, we do fact sheets, we arrange short seminars once a month. They call the Baltic Breakfast and we do it centrally and we get people from all around the society to engage with and to actually listen to, to uh, researchers telling them the latest news within this specific area. And it's always something that is high on the agenda, like in building windmills at sea or something. Um, we also believe in uh, the personal eye to eye the relationship building. So we try to make sure that researchers actually meet policy, uh, policy makers. And this is the example where our researcher Henrik Swedeng, who is doing research on herring, is at the European Parliament and talking to the politicians about his findings. And we do trips like that together with our communicators, our researchers and our stake, um, knowledge brokers. Mm -hmm. So, is it successful? Well, I don't know if I can say it is or not, but it has been evaluated a couple of times in science. Uh, you can read them and uh, I think there are some things that are constantly um, taken up from these papers that the personal relationships are important, trust is important, like Michael said. So you actually need to be out there and you need to talk to people. And I think the lessons we have learned um, and again, asking people that we work with is that the researcher appreciate this. Like you remember that they, they lack the opportunities to talk to policymakers. Well, we give them that kind of platform. Um, on the other hand, they also quite often feel that they can't prioritize the work. At, at our Baltic Sea Center, our researchers have time to do that, which is great, but of course, that is not how it looks in the rest of the world. So, but we feel like it's really important to go hand in hand, communicators and researchers and policy analysts to get the message through in an efficient way. Um, also very appreciated by stakeholders because they feel that they get the right information at the right time in the right format. Of course, to do, able to do that, you need to have, be really agile and flexible and be able to quickly answer an email from parliamenticians who's going up for a debate in two hours. So they say, what do you know about climate change and the water? And we can give them a short uh, sentence or a couple of sentences about it. Um, yeah, and as everyone who works with policy processes, it's a very long process. If you want to change something, you need to be persistent. And um, yeah, we have been doing it now for 10 years. Um, 
I hope that we have changed or will be, be uh, hope, uh, helping to change some policy decisions. Um, but it's not like a one shot. You have to really think a long time when you do this. Can I finish with one last question, actually? Because um, we don't really, we feel quite alone, to be honest. Um, we're constantly looking for other knowledge brokers at other universities around the world or around the Baltic would be great uh, to learn from them and to exchange experiences. So if you have someone you know about, <laughs> please send them to us and we can maybe work together even more. I think that's it. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs>but again, I also believe that our personal relationship building and the way for politicians to call us and say, can I talk to your best beautification researchers about, I have 10 questions. I think that's also something that is valuable, appreciated. Uh, and it's, of course, agencies work for the government. Huh? We work um, not only for the government, we also work for the opposition or stakeholders or other ones who wants to drive a political agenda so we help them all we serve all yes that's a good thing yes um do you also see risks with these kind of policy interactions i mean we've talked a bit about risks earlier but what would you say about the risks i think there's always a risk that you you become biased with the people the research you know and the things you hear about etc um so I think, uh, you know, if you're a governmental agency, you have the possibility to actually really get a lot of research working with you, etc. Um, whereas we, of course, work with mainly Stockholm University because we're paid from them, but also from the ones that we know about our network, etc. Uh, so I think we need to be really careful uh, also when we do our policy brief, making sure that uh, if there are different views, because sometimes scientists say different things, they don't agree, that we also mirror that when we so, communicate. Yeah, so what you're actually saying is to keep what Mikkel was, and Julian was talking about, values and facts apart. Yeah. What is the norm and what are, is actually the scientific findings? Is that what you're getting at? So, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. okay, because the research has come with that scientific findings, of course. Mm. Um, you said that Stockholm University is paying us in that case, you know, so that's unique then that Stockholm University has done this, right? I think so. Um, and I think it's a very... Last question. Is there yeah. anybody out there sort of maybe one? It's a, I think it's a very brave uh, move, actually. And um, of course, for some of our research projects, they also pay us to do policy work. So it's not only Stockholm University. Um, but I think um, I think it's something that sh should be part of the future, actually, because there's just so much information out there. And, you know, just putting out a press release, not sure it's going to reach the right policymakers, to be honest. I think you really need to be more targeted today. Well, thank you. We'll get back to these issues during panel discussion later. Thanks a lot, Ellen. Thank you. So you've been sitting now for a whole hour. So now you have like 10 minutes to talk to your neighbor. I'm sorry, there's no coffee. There's coffee at 11. So please don't leave the room, but, you know, stand up, stretch your legs. There'll be a 10 minute, you know, intervention of just talking to your neighbor and maybe discuss with your neighbor and end up with a mentee question that you can send to the panel. What has been lacking? What you, what you want to know more about? So 10 minutes, we'll be back at 10.15. You have a minute to settle in your seats and you know, I hope you feel a bit refreshed at least. 
And I've just realized I made a mistake. I promised coffee, but there's no coffee. <laughs> but there is at least refreshments out there at 11, so you can look forward to that. I'm sorry about that. All right, let's keep going. Um, now we have our fourth speaker, a wonderful person representing Young Academy of Sweden. Jessica Jewell, please, you're welcome here. Nice to have you here. You are an associate professor in energy transitions at the Department of Space, Earth and Environment at Chalmers University in Göteborg, Gothenburg. <clears throat> but you're also a professor at the Center for Climate and uh, Energy Transformation at the University of Bergen in Norway. Wonderful. Uh, you've been involved in a number of these science policy processes, for instance, the IPCC uh, underground, under groups. Uh, so uh, please, uh, it would be very interesting to hear your views on this science policy topic. Thank you so much. So today I'm going to talk about the science policy interface from my interaction and from my field. And I'm here both as a researcher and also as a member of the Swedish Young Academy. And I want to talk about the science policy interface and the opportunities and also the risks that come from it. And my starting point is that as scientists, we're very privileged. We're privileged to pursue our passions. We're privileged to pursue our curiosity. But with that privilege comes serious responsibility. And I think this resp these responsibilities were codified really nicely in this si paper in science from about 25 years ago. And these responsibilities for scientists are fourfold. One is focus on the most important issues. Two is do excellent science. Three is communicate our findings widely. And four is exercise good judgment, um, wisdom, and humility. And these are very nice words. And when you first read them, it sounds like, oh, great, let's just do this. But when you actually put it into practice, we run into some trade-offs and from some difficulties. And that's what I want to unpack today. And I want to unpack it with looking at the history of how climate science has interacted with policy. And climate science has interacted with policy in really three phases. And the first phase was when science alerts policymakers about the risk. So this is James Hansen. He was the director of the NASA Goddard Center in the US. And the scientific community had realized that climate was changing, that there was global warming. And, si and Jim Hansen came to the US Congress on a really hot August day in 1988. And he said, we have a problem. This is going to pose risks to our society. And the message that came back from scientists is, OK, well, what's the solution? Tell us what to do. You found a problem, now tell us what to do. And this dialogue started to move science into the second phase of climate science and policy. And in the second phase, science spent all years, almost decades, <laughs> identifying pathways to reduce climate risks. And the scientific finding was there are many solutions to a climate safe future. So this picture is from uh, the IR5 report, which was published in 2014. And in each of these cones is dozens, some, some, some of these cones have hundreds of pathways. That, and the lower pathways stabilize climate at a climate safe future. Now, this looking at these pathways and unpacking these pathways, policymakers and scientists themselves started to go into them, and then they started to be concerned. They said, well, can we really do this? A lot of these pathways that keep warming at two degrees actually have a ton of um, negative emissions. And so another question came from science, from policy, which reshaped how science, what we're focusing on today, which is but which solutions are feasible. What can we really do? And basically, policymakers said, OK, well, we can solve science. You can solve science in this, these mathematical models, but can we solve it in the real world? Because when scientists present these pathways, they said, OK, these pathways are feasible. But feasible means something very different to the scientist than it does to the politician. So something that's feasible for the policymaker means something that we can actually do. Something that's feasible to these scientists is something that solves in their mathematical models. And this is really where a lot of the climate change debate is today. Whether it's in Sweden, OK, is expanding wind fast enough or expanding nuclear fast enough? 
Or which policy instrument should we use? Will there be higher public acceptance for feed-in tariffs and renewable portfolio standards or carbon taxes? And this is really where the debate is today. Uh, this is also what I work on, which is how, which solutions are most feasible, which are most realistic to do in the real world. And I think with this, it, it, it's no longer just a scientific question. It's also a political question. It involves policy interaction. And there is agency here. And I think we see really two models dealing with this uh, interaction. One is co-production, which we've talked about this morning. And... The opportunities with this is that you do useful and relevant science and maybe you influence policy. That's what we're here for, right? But there's also a risk. And the risk is that this co-production becomes an echo chamber. Some scholars have called this um, codependence, not co-production, but actually codependence. And I think this is illustrated really nice. Uh, this is an article published earlier this year, which documents the history of the 1.5 target. And we often think of this target as a target that came from science. But it was actually adopted in Paris in 2015. And then policymakers said, OK, well, now we need the science. And scientists said, well, we really don't have science for this target. And policymakers said, well, can you make it? And scientists were like, oh, well, you know, we're not really sure that our two degree scenarios are actually realistic, you know. Um, well, but then scientists got curious because that's what we do. And also a lot of funding and um, political support came for pursuing this 1.5 target. And there was a ton of science that came out on this 1.5 target. So in some ways, this is really a success story of co-production because something comes from the policy sphere and science reorients itself. It also illustrates the risk of codependence that scientists already thought two degrees may be unrealistic and then we produced a ton of science for 1.5. Now, what's the other model of this interaction? And these are two archetypes, so th th there's, not, uh, there's always a mix with any uh, science policy uh, interaction. The second model is just throw it over the fence. Okay, we do our excellent science and we tell you what to do, we tell you what our science says. The, uh, the advantage here is that it stays very independent and true to the science. But there is a risk. It avoids the policy question. And I think this is illustrated really nicely with the same 1.5 report that I just spoke about. So scientists were asked, okay, well, is this feasible? And the 1.5 report says limiting warming to 1.5 is possible within the laws of chemistry and physics. And as a policymaker, you say, well, you know, great. I'm glad we're not breaking laws of chemistry and physics, but, you know, there are also other laws and um, mechanisms that we may need to consider. And in the um, press conference, uh, this is from, uh, this was what Jim Skia said about feasibility. He said, we have delivered the message to governments. Now it is up to them to decide the final feasibility step. So you see really these two models of just throw it over the fence or this codependence. And both have opportunities and risks. Now, the way I try to deal with this in my own work is I try to work on important problems in a slightly smaller um, with slightly smaller boundaries. So I was recently asked by Australia's largest utility to, of if, their, if the um, transformation scenario, this is their most ambitious transformation scenario with the most rapid decarbonization, if it's feasible. And rather than giving them a yes or no answer, I started breaking it up into individual components and saying, OK, well, what can we learn from world leaders? And today I'm just going to show you how we analyzed wind in this. So this is the growth of wind power in this scenario. And what we did was we said, OK, well, let's look at the fastest growing countries and compare it to what needs to happen in Australia. And also what the most ambitious countries plan for wind power. And so rather than returning with a yes or no question, yes, it's feasible or no, it's not, we said, yes, it's feasible if Australia can put as much energy and effort into growing wind as Sweden and Germany have. So I want to conclude by returning to this social contract for science. And with I think we have several obligations as scientists. One is to focus on the most important problems, but make them specific and concrete enough so that they're relatable within policy arenas. 
The second is do excellent science, of course. The third is communicate in a relatable way. So we shouldn't only just communicate our findings widely, but we need to make them relatable to the policy um, problems and policy issues which policymakers are facing. The fourth is we need to do this while exercising humility. As Michael said this morning, we need to be prepared to say when we don't know. This is not a problem for science. This is a problem for society. Now, you may have noticed that there's, this is a one-sided contract that I presented. There are only obligations here for scientists. And in many ways, that's fair, because we are the privileged party in this, con in this contract. But I'm going to step outside of my own humility now and suggest maybe there's also some obligations for society and for policymakers here. And I'm going to suggest two. One is be prepared for inconvenient answers. Often policymakers come to science and say, well, can you show us how to do this? Can you show us how to do that? And we need to be prepared that sometimes this or that may not be feasible. It may not be possible to do in the real world. And we need to be prepared for that. And the second is we shouldn't shift democratic decisions onto scientists. So the environmental challenges that we're facing involve a number of trade-offs. There are winners and losers no matter what path we take. And it is not scientists who should decide who can be the winners, who should be the winners and losers. It is the democratic process that, where this needs to be negotiated. Scientists can inform this process in the role of honest broker, in the role of knowledge broker, and elucidate the trade-offs, and also suggest policies that can help ameliorate the case for the losers. But we cannot make these decisions. So thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to a conversation. <laughs> so, thanks a lot, Jessica, for really sort of structuring the roles of scientists. Uh, would you say that your experience is that the researchers are, you know, more or less willing to step into these different roles? Where are the more comfortable the ones, sort of? Um, in my field, scientists are very. Uh, I mean, we're trained to go out to society and to interact with different stakeholders. I mean, all the, uh, even in our PhDs, I think uh, we don't always have enough reflection about which role we're playing and which model we're operating under. So are we kind of thinking in this linear model of science and just throw it over the fence? Or are we thinking in this stakeholder model and aware of the risks? So I think scientists are very comfortable, but I think we need, um, we need to be more reflective about what role we're playing in different contexts. That links back to your, you said, relatable, which I thought was a nice way of putting it, sort of that putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and understanding these possibilities. Uh, <clears throat> so what's the role then of universities trying to bridge that and see how you can you know, increase the understanding. We've touched upon dialogue so many times today so far. Yeah, I mean, well, so universities are home to many scientists, not all scientists in society. Um, so, I mean, I think universities have a role to train scientists in communication and also bring um, stakeholders and members of the public in to challenge us within our environment. Because you were also sort of, you know, stressing the fact that every solution, a policy solution, is always transdisciplinary. I mean, as we talked about earlier, values and norms. How do you as a researcher sort of um, prepare yourself to handle that with that transdisciplinary approach? Well, I think there are two things to keep in mind here. And one is um, who, who your stakeholders are with any transdisciplinary disciplinary problem and what interests or values they may have. So I take different approaches depending on the scientific problem and the policy problem, right? So if I'm working with vested interests, then I really need to have an arm's length approach so as not to be captured by that agenda. Um, whereas if I'm working with a specific policy case or a specific, you know, so Australia comes to me and says, okay, well, is this feasible? They really need a specific concrete answer and way to understand the challenges that they face. All right. So <clears throat> is there also a role for the funding agencies in sort of supporting these mechanisms? Well, I would like to see a similar increase in reflection in the funding agencies to uh, stakeholder engagement and co-production 
as I think we need to do as scientists. So I think often in funding, in, at least in my field, there's this idea, okay, more stakeholders is always better. And I think we need to be cognizant of, okay, well, what policy problem are we dealing with here? What scientific problem? And based on that, what should be our relationship to different stakeholders? And sometimes it should be arm's length. They should not be involved in our pr project. Um, and sometimes it should be, um, we need to have more space to have specific stakeholder dialogue with, with a smaller group of stakeholders. So maybe a final question then. So what's your experience of working with different stakeholders? Yeah, so I think one of my best experiences actually came when I was working at the International Energy Agency and um, national policymakers had asked the agency to help them understand this new world of energy security. This was in the last energy crisis about a decade ago. And I think it worked really well because there was um, a structured organization and there was a lot of interest from high level um, policymakers. So it wasn't just something that we had come up with, but it was a lot of interest to, they needed help understanding this new world. And I think we were able to do that because there was both interest and then capacity on our side. Thanks a lot. A warm applause for this. <clears throat>So now we come to the final part of this session and uh, I have the privilege of uh, inviting three people up with me and we will have a panel discussion. And now we will also try to uh, answer all, all your questions that's come up, so we'll get back to this. So uh, come and have a seat with me here. First, Amanda Wood, you are a researcher at Stockholm University Stockholm Research Cent Resilience Center. Yes. So many Stockholm there, yes. Uh, you've done a lot of, in your research on food security issues, you've done a lot of work with stakeholders. So I think we're going to get back to stakeholders now talking. Marie-Louise Henel Sandström, please uh, welcome up here on the, on, the, um, on the podium. You are a member of the Swedish Parliament uh, and you are also on the board of this very interesting organization where members of Parliament meet researchers. And we'll be getting back to that, please. And uh, last but not least, Anders Grönvall, you are Today, an independent person, which is wonderful for you, right? But you have a background which is interesting for this concept because you have, you're a journalist by training, you've worked with the NGO sector, but you also have a long history in the political field, both as um, leading of the opposition at the municipality level, but also within the parliament as state secretary for the Minister for Environment for then at, during those days for the Social Democratic Party. But I'd like to underline that you are now totally independent from a political point of view, which I think is important in this discussion. So I'll try to grab a seat as well here. <clears throat> well, dear participants, nice to have you here. Welcome. Um, let's start. You've been listening through the morning here and should we just go around the table first you know what is your impressions is this something where you've been thinking oh wonderful that they talked about this or no i'm lacking this amanda would you like to go first you know, yeah thank you. you thank you so much thanks for having me today um it's just been a fantastic morning listening to the speakers and i think a lot resonated in terms of what are these obstacles what are the realities what are the risks but also the opportunities but i think one thing that was really interesting is trust came up again and again so when you think about this science policy interface it's not just evidence and then a policy decision there's actually a foundation under underneath that, uh, and that is often this trust and relationship building, which hopefully we'll get to expand upon a little bit. What it is. Yes, and I'm very grateful to be here, to participate in these uh, very interesting discussions. And I also think about some of the words I've heard lots of times. It was trust, of course, and communication, and uh, politicians, as I am, keep your fingers off. So now I know that. But it's very interesting just to how we communicate. And I know they said that you have to communicate reliable so that you can have communicate in the right way, I think. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I want to lift three things. The first is that uh, the politicians and the, the people and the, the ordinary people is not separated. They are the same thing, actually, and acting as the, as the same thing. So you can't uh, put politicians on a 
as outside you will look at all the people and how they react so, so you mean that the policy makers are really sort of representing yes. the public in a democracy yeah, and of course, so yes. of course yeah. and the second thing is that at uh, they know that uh, we are facing uh, more enormous threats by uh, climate change loss of biodiversity and pollution and they're known for maybe 50 years and the sad thing is you saw this picture of Jim Hansen talking to the to the the American and Congress and actually most of the emissions we have today uh, have emitted after this event and not enough politics has ha happened not enough policy has changed that do you mean the knowledge is already there the, the basic knowledge is there of the threat but the the important thing is the knowledge of how to solve the problems are not there. So I think politicians have to look at polit politi political science. And political science has uh, investigated this for many years and trying to understand why people are reacting. And Michael, uh, Michael <laughs> talked about the wicked problems. The wicked problems when, when you have a negative effect in short term in the long-term uh, policies, the long-term policies for climate change. So, so that, that, that's important to, to, to learn more about. And that's my, because I've, I've been, since I left, uh, left the government in October, I've tried to understand this enormous failure. Okay, so you're actually, actually yeah, I mean, yes, we'll, and we'll get I, back to the, the lack yeah. of, of action, really. Yes, yes, yes. So Marilis, would you agree with him that the knowledge is there? And, uh, <clears throat> I think that some of the knowledge is there, of course, a lot of knowledge is there, but already it changes and we need more knowledge, of course, and we have to new, talk more about the solutions and uh, is it feasible and so we have, I think we, have, we always need more knowledge, but most it is there, of course, and, and all the politicals, politicals we also we, we know a lot about it, but we have to discuss how to the financing and how to priority and how we can work with it, I think. So do you experience the same, Amanda, because you, you've been working a lot with different stakeholders. Is the knowledge there? or? So I think a lot of knowledge is already there. Um, in terms of specific solutions, sometimes not, because sometimes we just need to experiment and actually try something and then research if it works. So I think there is a line between kind of the knowledge to act, which I think is often there, depending on what uh, topic and issue you're looking at and then knowledge about specific interventions that might work and we might have knowledge about similar interventions that have or haven't worked in the past but maybe not that specific one so we have to be a little brave in, in trying trying new things but I think where it gets really tricky is where uh, the argument comes that we just need more knowledge as a way to delay action, mm -hmm. to deliberately delay action. Yeah, yeah just um, asking for another commission to investigate something. Yes. Would you agree? Does this happen? Oh, people are laughing. Yeah, <laughs> <Well, Yes. laughs> <laughs> some well, very special topics right now. Of course, I'm working with lots of with education, and we have a very big uh, about digitalization in the school. We have that for several years, and now we have another discussion to so take away all the digitalization and use books more. So that's a very big difference, I think, in, in the school, in, in education. So then we have to listen. Maybe something wasn't, it was, maybe it was very good, but not it was good enough. Now we have to change. That's a really big change, I think, in school. Anders, would you agree? Well, in, in environment issues, uh, we often looked at efficient uh, uh, tools to make it much efficient. but. I think we have to uh, forget that and look more on the the way to navigate through a lot of obstacles to avoid short term negative effects for for p people and to to have more packages that uh, solve both the negative short term uh, effects and the long term positive effects in, uh, like the fit for 55 package in the European Union that's a big good example of how you have to navigate through all the obstacles and that of course is between countries but you can uh, think the same in in different groups in in the country so would you from your different experience would you say that research is, is up and running on these issues I mean because it sounds to me as if you're acting actually asking for a new kind of research or a collaborate, collaborative research or 
if I'm no, misunderstanding. No, no, I'm talking about political science. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that for sure. But you need probably need science to support yes. that? Yes, or? of course. Yeah. What kind of science would that be then? I think we have a lot of science, so that no, that's not a problem. We need science for de the details, like the waste uh, water management that Ellen talked about. That's a very good example when when the the policymakers need technical uh, issues to make the right decisions. So, so of course, that's mm -hmm. a, a very important job work. But I'm talking more uh, overarching. Okay. <laughs> but but Marilo, is when you are, you know, in your role as a member of the parliament, and how would you then do to get in touch and create this trust and dialogue that we've been talking about so much? Yes, um, there are lots of ways. And as, as a member of the parliament, I think one, one big deal, deal of my job is... Uh, to be out to, to countries and, and visit researchers. And, and you started to talk about the, the RIFO, which we have a, a network in the parliament it, with, with the researchers and politicians. And we follow each other, so follow each other's works, and meet them and we talk how we can work together and how we can make better decisions to listen to the researchers, of course. So I think we have, a, maybe we can meet more and we learn more, but uh, we can invite, and we can also be invited to researchers. As we like to be invited, <laughs> and also we like to invite. So we have uh, lots of big seminars in the in the parliament just to discuss some important things. But would you say that uh, researchers understand what kind of support you need, or is that because I've been hinted throughout the morning that there is a understanding gap, if one can say that in English, I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yeah, I heard that, and that's very interesting. Huh? And I've, maybe I think that it's uh, reality, that is the gap, maybe, because uh, we have to think about, of course, we have to listen to the researchers, and also we have to think about, um, now in Sweden and Europe and the world, of course, how we can work with it, and how we can do with it, just for, I told for the the priorities we have to do, and the finances we have to do, and we also have to see if that's... Uh, Solutionable? Is it uh, is it the right thing to do? So we have to think for the ethical things about it and how we can do for the democracy, democracy, and how we can do it so it be also good for the people. And uh, I will listen to researcher, but is that the right thing? Because I listen to other researcher and have to make a decision. But Okay, yeah, that's, that's again building trust and getting all the different angles of it. I mean, um, I mean, Amanda, I know that in your research you've been having a lot of dialogue with different stakeholders. How did you go about that? And what's, what is your experience from this? Yeah, so I think first thing first, and I think it's been touched on today, um, how do you build this in the first place? So this is knowing uh, who to connect with. I think this is just sometimes a given that we know who to connect with. And I think it was Ellen talking about finding finding the correct audience. So I think this is one of the first tasks uh, that you need to do. And then again, this relationship building. So these kinds of um, asking for policy advice or uh, leading dialogues, they don't just happen. No one, uh, in my experience, they don't just reach out to you in a cold call and ask. So this does take, as, as you were saying, this takes many interactions. This takes inviting decision makers to open seminars that you may be having. It's dedicating time to coffees and understanding what's going on in their organization. It's all of these micro interactions. And I think it was maybe Julian saying that you need to do this before crisis uh, comes. Like this needs to be in a calm period. So uh, spending that time to develop that relationship so you understand their needs, but they also understand your offer in terms of what you are actually researching and what you can produce. I think that is very important. Is time as a researcher to do this? Is it possible? Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what would you like to see then to make this happen? So I think one thing, and it's been touched on quite a bit, is actually having these distinct roles. So I think asking a researcher to fit one more thing into their pie of, you know, researching papers, funding, teaching, supervision, all of these things. This just means they will get burnout doing it or they will do none of those things particularly well. So I think having these more specific uh, roles, like I think your organization is a great example. I think um, Mikhail was talking about boundary organizations. Um, 
all different types of, of roles, policy councils, policy analysts, uh, industry postdocs, all different kinds of roles where this is more the expectation that is this is your job to do. And then along with that, we've talked about kind of the evaluation and incentives of researchers. If you create these new positions, then you can't judge them on uh, how many academic publications do you turn out every year and how many students do you supervise? There needs to be a new kind of criteria that matches the responsibilities and the tasks of these roles. I hear that quite a lot, sort of, the, the fact that the universities now that are not really giving you credits for doing this kind of outreach. It's, it's, it's not a it's part of there, your career possibility. It's there, but it's maybe at the end. Oh, by the way, this is also because I think it was your colleague who said this is the third task, it is a legal requirement. But if you look at the actual requirements, it's mostly around what have you published, where have you published, what are your teaching hours in a classroom, in a classroom, and uh, how many students, and then kind of those last criteria are more around. And can you also prove that you can communicate your science? Okay. So, yeah. Now, this is interesting. So, from your p different perspectives, would you agree that this is a part of that stakeholder connection, Anders? Yes, of course. And also, don't underestimate to reach out to people in the lower agencies and the lower, because it will come up to people like. <laughs> so, so, what you're saying is go to the civil service and talk to them? or. or Every, everywhere uh, it will it will come up in the system uh, if it's interesting information uh, it will reach the politicians or the the the, the head of the departments mm -hmm. so that's important also so maybe it's not so easy to get to ministers and state secretaries and and parliaments the uh, parliamentarians but you can reach the people in the organization beneath them because it will reach them okay. so you've been working both at municipality level for a long time but also then at the highest governmental level yep. was there big differences in you sort of that getting all the researchers etc from the research perspective hey, now? competence <laughs> of course, level, yeah, of course uh, yes. if you work in the government you have the best competence you have the best people yep. around you so okay. they can yep. uh, but in the smaller areas you don't, so you have to... So, so, so how would one go about it then, at, say for instance, the municipality level? How can science then support that level? Um, or shouldn't they? Yes, of course, uh, they should support and they, they should support, uh, they meet, people from different uh, municipalities meet together and, and maybe they can invite uh, researchers to, to help them, so that's uh, important. And the, the regional organizations, Landstyrelsen, is uh, doing good work everywhere, but informing the municipalities in, in different um, environment issues. That's the way I know. So, so. And Marilla, is from your position in the parliament, is that a different position? I mean, you're supposed to keep an eye on what the government is doing, etc., and push them. So what, is, what are your views on this, what Amanda is saying, the stakeholder outreach? Uh, yes, um, I agree some of things what you said, of course, but I think that, uh, and also that Anders told that you have to be on the lower level, and I will come back to the, the education studies I work with. So we, we always also used to talk to the to students, of course, not only the leader, yeah. the students, and also the scientist students, have, they have their, uh, well, who is it working to be a student? And we have science, and they say we have lots of problems sometimes to get the time and problems to, to reach their politics, and sometimes maybe they don't want to meet the politics, as we, have, as we heard here. And I also agree that, agree that we have to be, I have to be pre prepared to whoever we meet as a stakeholder, and they have to be prepared to meet me, of course, so we can reach each other on the right level. And I, I used to, when I will meet some um, um, scientists, perhaps, I also I like to read, read them out. out. Before, so I know about what the scientists have done and what's important for this scientist and maybe some public publications that they have done before so we can have a, a discussion on the right level I think mm -hmm. and then all of so think that they will do the same for me they know that I'm working with some questions and the work I know that I'm working with uh, with education and higher education and I, and I know much about it but I'm, I need to need more of course so I think we have to prepare from both sides mm. to get the right discussions and um, mm. so is that linked to what Jessica was bringing on the table you know that how do you accept an in inconvenient uh, suggestion or a decision <laughs> how do you handle that uh, when the researchers say you're doing the wrong thing guys <laughs> 
then we have a long discussion, I think. <laughs> Perhaps we can agree, maybe not. Maybe we can be agree that we don't know each other, we need each other, we don't reach each other in this topic, maybe. But we can have a discussion so I can listen, of course, and, we can li and they can listen to me, and sometimes we say that we can't be agree here. But also it's important just to listen. Okay. Would you you Sorry. Well, my experience is that uh, um, politicians are often often locked in their views from all both sides <laughs> and uh, if uh, researchers are researchers are coming to them with uh, with new information it's difficult to move uh, outside from, the box is yeah. that what you're talking about yeah. and the box is set f by values norms yes like values or? norms experience or i don't know the, mm. the, the voters in your yeah the voters the maybe, voters yes mm. what is it yeah. yeah so how 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 should science approach that by uh, performing facts, by showing facts about it. So in the long term, uh, the truth and the facts are winning, of course. But do you, do you think the scientists understand the fact that the policy makers sometimes are within the box? No. Oh, okay. So how do we bridge that then? <laughs> do you, do you experience the same thing, Amanda? That boxing sort of... I think it depends. You can. I think it's just human nature. Scientists can do this as well. Um, we are only human. So I think on that human understanding, you can understand how people get um, set in their kind of um, set in their preferred paths or preferred solutions. Um, so I think it is bringing those facts, and it's just consistency of message over and over. Sometimes when we hear something the first time, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite sink in. Uh, so hearing that multiple ways uh, can be helpful too. Okay, yeah, multiple ways. I thought I was going to bring in some questions from Menti. Please help me out somebody um, who can give us a question. Do we have questions? Yes, here we are. David is up there. Uh, it's working, I think. Just go, just keep talking. I think they're functioning. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we have some questions here. Ellen, perhaps? Aha, uh -huh, okay, uh, then we have a problem. Okay, but so let's, let's bring it on and we'll hear these guys' reflection on this. All right, yeah. That. Maybe we can start with one for the, for the panel uh, yes, sitting here do. right now. Uh, so we have one here. Um, so the UNESCO guidelines for open science have one area called open dialogue with other knowledge systems. Uh, maybe if the panel can reflect on this, that's the question. Okay, open dialogue with other knowledge systems, was that the wording? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Does this ring a bell? <laughs> Oh, go once ago, please. Amanda. Uh, I'm not familiar with this um, specifically, but I think this is kind of a cornerstone. We've talked about transdisciplinary research and having this open dialogue um, and recognizing that there are a lot of different knowledge systems, not just uh, in research, not just knowing what policy is, but um, lots of different knowledge systems. Um, are out there. So I think if you are engaging in transdisciplinary research, this is probably something that you are very aware of and are trying to bring into your work. Um, no, and I also think that UNESCO has a very important role to discuss with other countries. We can talk about academic freedom, and then we have to talk it to other countries who don't have that. So mm -hmm. we have to have a, tell our opinion, of course, and listen to their other which, which I think is a wrong uh, thing, they think. But I think it's very important to listen to other countries and other disciplinaries and other uh, knowledges. So I think it's very important. So UNESCO is very important with that, just to international discussion. Well, I think it's important for the university to have uh, transdisciplinary uh, groups working like uh, Michael working at... Uh, uh, what they call climate. <laughs> yes, there are, there are different uh, p uh, people from different uh, disciplines working together, and and uh, and that's important if you want to design policy and if you are going to help policymakers. You have to have pol political science, chemistry, biology, everything in 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 the same discussion. So, so you're actually talking about both, you know, social sciences, yes, sciences, social science, know, bridging yes. it. Uh, yes to understand why people, why people react on def different policies and why some policies doesn't work because uh, people don't like uh, when it's not cheap to <laughs> fill up the car. <laughs> 
for example. Aspect, definitely. Mm. Anything else, David, from down here, or from the David? Maybe. Yeah, we have some questions here. Uh, here's another one. Um, can there be career paths uh, for researchers, I assume, uh, where some uh, roles are being done more at a certain moment in their career uh, and where they have to um, sort of... Uh, can I, I was signed out here, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so actually, where they career have to paths for show how they construct their career, uh, taking these different facets into account. Okay, that's touching upon what you talked about, yeah, Amanda. I think you so, know. yeah, yeah. Is this beneficial for your university career or your science career, research career? So, I think people have made career paths out of um, sort of this more knowledge broker translation. I think it's a lot dependent on your setting your institution so my institution is very sympathetic to doing this work and very supportive yours is obviously as well we're both under stockholm university but other places not so much um, and in my experience a lot of people who do this they they kind of develop the love coming as a researcher and then develop the love for translating this so they find ways to make it work they find this little pot of funding or they find a synth sympathetic funder who will let them drop everything for two months to write a policy brief. Um, but I would love to see more formalized roles that are more widespread, so you don't have to rely on your specific institution being very supportive of this, but you actually would have mobility uh, anywhere that you go. So how could uh, the parliament and support this? Would you agree? Is it necessary? Yeah, I think it's necessary, and uh, I'm just thinking how we can do it. Yes, <laughs> yes, good. That's why I think we want to understand, so I can think about it. Okay, yes, we can yes. <laughs> well, uh, You mentioned policy brief. I think that's a uh, good thing, and the, the the committees in the parliament should uh, reach out to the university and get the p more policy briefs and, and get the uh, educational meetings where they can they can learn more about different things in, in a policy level. So that's something they have to work more by. And also government people should meet uh, with. Uh, so the, it's a responsibility for the for political side also to, to reach out and, and get more information and get more knowledge. So maybe we have time for... Is there, oh, there's a question no, here as yes, well. Say, yes. yes, please, so of course. Now, oh, yes. <laughs> maybe we can, get, we can get a mic there. Meanwhile, while we're waiting, yes, please, Marit. Yes, we have heard, heard a little bit about the younger stand, students here before the Academy of Younger Students, and that's very important for us to meet them, to hear um, their problems about how how they get salaries when they are do the researchers, and how they can, if you can stay in Sweden to when they are working here after their PhD, for example. So I think we have lots of topics we can discuss with the students and researchers, of course, and the, how they can. Um, make it better, better life for them to make this students. That sounds promising. Please. Hello, Michael Zadzanis from the Austrian Research Promotion Agency, but forget about it because the question is uh, coming from me uh, in my competence as a citizen. Um, I have a very provocative question and I apologize in advance if I step out of the very thin um, line of political and academic correctness. Um, we heard in the morning excellent examples, mostly though from the natural sciences, where a scientific consensus is more or less settled or even old plated in the case of uh, climate science with the IPCC. What do we do with fields of science that um, scientific consensus or the truth is debatable or debated uh, that are uh, advising policy a lot? And I will make it concrete. Uh, um, uh, economic professors, I think the greatest majority of economic professors still believe in infinite growth in a finite system. Um, and it's not, I'm not saying that they are talking bullshit to, uh, to, um, to policy. They are stuck in their, in their scientific paradigm, which is crumbling, but still they are re recognized academics publishing in their uh, scholarly um, venues. And they're giving advice to, to policies. How, what do we do <laughs> with these fields of science? Yes, thank you. So actually, what do we, how do we handle, because we've been touching upon this in the presentations, how do we handle when science is not united around one major um, 
opinion. You know, there are different opinions. What, what is your views on this? Yeah, I think in the work that we do, sustainability science, a lot of um, really social science, very transdisciplinary. Uh, so it often is not very clear cut. And so I think you need to be transparent. I think we've said this multiple times, transparent about what you know and what you don't know and what is fact and then what needs to be decided by society because it's based on value. So I think being transparent, like this is where I stand. I really, I really want to work towards sustainable food systems. That is, that is my value. That is my normative stance. That's where I'm coming from. Uh, be transparent and then, yeah, try, try as much as you can to say, this is the facts here, you know, here is the consensus or here is another competing field. And I think we've been talking about, you know, here are the pros and cons of different sides. So just kind of laying it out on that table is a start. Uh, time is running. This is so interesting, but I would like to give you a short, short final question. You can now decide everything. You are sort of the emperors or whatever. So what would you like to see happen tomorrow? I think, Anders, you were already sort of on top of this. <laughs> yes. uh, environment surveillance. I think uh, the, the science must, must help uh, the politicians now because we are in a really difficult situation. If you look at biodiversity, uh, many things are happening now all over the world that is really worrying. And uh, the this, this science must help us to see this, because if we see things early, we might uh, react. Uh, the ecosystems are very complex, and in the sea that you work with is extra complex, and, and uh, small changes and small happenings can mean uh, catastrophe. In okay, so you're actually talking about so environment, science, science. monitoring, etc. Yes, that's so more, more money for that. More money for that, yes. Thank you. Uh, marie <laughs> And I can't uh, promise more money right now, <laughs> but I can take that we have more uh, closer and more uh, direct discussions with the science So we can discuss the reality and we can meet, maybe I can to be uh, where you're working and follow your field and we're talking about environment, for example. So I can have more exact discussions and we can listen to each other. And I think that uh, make it easier to uh, make the right decisions. So Thank not you. more money, but better decisions. Thank you. Amanda, finally. Sure, I'll summarize just a few things that have already been said, but I think, again, creating these more specialized roles um, is very important, but also then the infrastructure around that. So we've talked about financing. So these aren't jobs that you do on top. These are actual additional jobs that require more resources. And then training. So this isn't just in universities for researchers who are already there. This is, as we've talked about, preparing students, masters, PhDs. What do you need to step into these roles? Some disciplines, uh, I've heard, we heard today, some are already prepared in this and others are are not prepared at all to step into this. Um, so I think it's not just creating that opportunity, but then having a lot of attractors, training, financing, um, good evaluation criteria, all of those things are also important. Thanks a lot. A warm applause, I think, for these guys. <laughs> so I will now leave the floor to the organizers again for 30 seconds of wrapping up, and you will very soon have a break. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Working? Yes, it, it is working. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I'll tell now, I don't think as a wrap-up will be very shocking to you. Science and policy is not a marriage made in heaven. And there are many reasons for that, and Mikkel gave a lot of them, and, and we all understand them. This is not also a marriage of love, this is more marriage of convenience. But frankly speaking, in current worlds, we do not have choice. Science and policy needs to work together, and it's not only beneficial for both spouses here, but it's also beneficial for the third parties, like the society and our democracies. And we talked a lot, we used a lot of ideas and a lot of concepts how to make it better. We talked about trust, we talked about uh, bridging, we talked about, understand uh, we talked about communication, we talked about uh, uh, specific institutional solutions, reform of the research assessment and so on and so forth. What we didn't talk too much, I think, is understanding. Understanding 
to avoid misconceptions, understanding where is the limit of science, and this is a bit what Julian was saying in his presentation, where the role of the scientists ends, where the role of policymakers or politicians starts, but also understanding how we actually take the decision. I know we all try to think that we are rational people, uh, that we base our decisions on facts. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's not actually really truth. Facts are part of our decision-making process, but there are also other factors, values. Biases, we all bias. It's not the policymakers, they are biased. The scientists are also biased, and we had already hints about this uh, here. So, without this basic understanding who we are, what is our role, how we behave, how we take the decision, we will not build trust. We will not reform anything, and we will not build bridges. So, with this kind of uh, thought, I want to leave you, uh, and I'll give the floor now to my fellow. I just want to say thank you. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to the panel. Thanks to Gun for brilliant moderating. Uh, also a big sh thanks to uh, Vetenskap och Allmänhet and the technician for making this session run so smoothly. And of course, thank you for coming. So, great.